and B, you still haven't solved the rest of their problems. They still, are, they still are illiterate. They still don't go to work. They still don't know how to be independent. So, so to change them from who they are today to the person we hope they'll be in a year is a holistic, it is a total, a transformational change. It's like going from, from water to ice, which is, a, which is the best example I can give you of, of, of a holistic transformation. You know, water is liquid, ice is solid. They are different. And you want to make that big a change in the way people live and in the way they, they uh, spend their lives. That was the thawing portion that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so if you think about it, what we're saying is we want these people to, take, to thaw out from this version and then to refreeze into this version. The transformation is the thawing phase. But they're literally different shapes. Yeah, in, in a sense, I mean morphing to use a modern computer term would be an example. But you do become different. An antelope is not just a short-necked giraffe. <laughs> you know, and a lion isn't just a giraffe that eats meat. They're different. Well, a productive citizen in a healthy family living in a safe neighborhood with their children going to schools at work and with all of them having an expectation of having a better future through, through uh, having good jobs is totally different from being trapped in a neighborhood of violence with a system that won't let you go to work, being dependent on a bureaucrat who doesn't have, have a clue what your name is or who your family is, and having to send your kids to, to a monopoly that will destroy them. I mean, they're, they're different structures, different behaviors. Strategy number two is that to get to here, you have to have individual commu and community responsibility and involvement. This cannot just be imposed from the out. People who are in here have to be recruited, attracted, drawn to wanting to do this. They have to have both involvement and responsibility. They are changing their lives. We're not magically intervening them and giving them good citizen shots. I mean, they're full grown, you know, a lot of them are full grown human beings. They've, they've got to reach the decision inside themselves that the time has come to change their lives. The time has come to do something different. I should say, in terms of developing these whole ideas, I, I want to mention that uh, Jane Fortson, who's here today, uh, is a senior fellow at the Progress and Freedom Foundation, and that she and Marvin Olasky, uh, who's also a senior fellow there, have been enormously helpful. And that uh, Victoria Duran-Gonzalez, who's with the Atlanta Project, uh, has uh, been an advisor and critic and, and uh, debater and uh, in many, many different ways has helped us think about all these things over the last two years. And the Atlanta Project is a good example of what we're talking about. The Atlanta Project is an effort which I think is halfway between these two. I think it is, it's the largest effort in a comprehensive way, heavily using volunteers, to try to impact on helping the poor transform themselves. And I think to the degree it succeeds, it's going to succeed because it has some of this in it. To the degree it's not succeeding right now, it's because it's not radical enough. But it's got to go one more layer of being clear with itself about how big the change is. But the Atlanta Project is a very heroic effort, which was launched by President Carter when, frankly, he could very easily have done nothing. And I, and I, I have often said I think he has been uh, the most influential of our former presidents in modern times because he has stayed active, he's stayed involved, and he's done things. And I'd like you to take just a minute and look at uh, the Atlanta Project and what it's trying to accomplish. We felt that somewhere in God's world there needed to be some proof that in a, a major metropolitan area something could be done about human deprivation and suffering. So lo and behold, here comes the most active ex-president in the history of America who says that he's going to bring his vast resources to bear on the problem of fighting poverty in this city in Atlanta. This notion that each of us has the ability to make life better, not only for ourselves, but for others, is I think at the base of the Atlanta Project. I think we are going to see an absolutely amazing outpour of volunteers, folk who honest to goodness believe that they can create a better Atlanta. When Bill and Richard Marriott uh, were uh, approached by uh, President Carter, it uh, didn't take much of anything to, uh, to get them uh, really uh, turned on and committed uh, to this particular endeavor. The CEO said, we not only will give you half a million dollars or a million dollars, but we want to be personally involved and we want our corporations involved and our employees involved in a real meaningful way. 
Uh, we believe as our communities thrive, we thrive. We also believe that we're only as strong as our weakest link. Uh, so as we strengthen that link, uh, we all benefit. Jimmy Carter has brought a dream and a vision, not only to Atlanta, but I believe ultimately to the country. It's to me his greatest quality, is his ability to dream and his ability to articulate a vision and to gather people around that vision. I think what the Carter Project does is give us a time and say, wait a minute, we've gone as far as we can go alone. We've got to reach down and take the rest of God's children with us. If the Atlanta Project can help to take these huge problems and break them down into pieces so that individuals can say, well, if I work on this piece, I'll have some confidence that somebody else will be working on that piece, and together we can make a difference. We'll make a difference because people are going to deal with people, regular people, black and white, rich and poor, young and old, will come together to solve the problems. You know, you can't help but remember when we won the Olympics, folk really didn't shout and scream, I am an African American and I am proud that we have the Olympics. Folk didn't say, I am from the poor of Atlanta and we got the Olympics. People said, I am from Atlanta and this is what we won. My hope is that something called the Atlanta Project will in fact, as best as any action can do, erase those lines, sometimes terribly deep, between and among our communities. The, uh, the Atlanta Project, by trying to bring together government, business, private volunteerism in a collaborative effort with the community, uh, I think is a very, very important experiment in the right direction. And we, and, uh, we do this number of things to try to work with them. And I think that to the degree it's got a problem, it's because it's only a piece of this. Uh, Jane Fortune really developed the seven strategies. And as you go through all of them, you begin to realize, okay, community and individual responsibility and participation is important, but there are a bunch more. And you've got to have all seven working simultaneously in order for us to have even a chance this winning. Strategy number three in that sense is productivity and safety. We listed them together for this reason. They're about reality. The reality is you either have a way of making businesses that are profitable and that survive or you don't. The reality is you're either physically safe or you're not. Now, if you're not safe, it's a lot harder to create businesses. If you can't create businesses, it's a lot harder to convince people that they ought to follow a path of non-crime. So they're linked together, but they're about, they're about genuinely having to solve problems in this system that you can't just kid yourself about. Doesn't do you a lot of good to put money in here if when the money's done, there's no business there. So you gotta start asking yourself, under what circumstances can we make businesses succeed? How, what changes in tax law do you need? What changes in regulation do you need? How can we make it profitable to have a business that is permanently in the inner city because it makes money being there. Which, by the way, means at least intellectually, if you want to help the poor, you have to worry about helping the businesses that help the poor. And you cannot love those who get, create jobs, but hate those who create jobs. You gotta decide, we have a schizophrenia in America today. And we gotta say, okay, I want, I want 100,000 jobs for poor people, and if I could find 100 people, each of whom would create 1,000 jobs, that'd be a good thing. Well, then you may have to change the law to encourage those 100 people to do it. But if you do that, then you get in the whole question of, well, what if they get more money out of getting more money? Because it just, should, should the fact of creating a thousand jobs be a good thing or a bad thing? Should we reward it back to incentives or should we punish it? Similarly, you can't tolerate violence because if you have violence, when you start creating the jobs, they'll leave. Jobs will, I don't, it's very hard to create an economic incentive worth getting killed over.